All right, so it's a pleasure to welcome David Hall, who's a lecturer at AUT and a director of Climate Innovation Labs. Thanks for joining me. Hi. It's great to have you here. And the ironic thing is that uh, normally you're in Auckland and I'm in Christchurch. Yeah. And because of lockdown, you're actually in Christchurch, not that far away from me. And yet we're doing it by Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I am here um, on the farm that I grew up in, in in North Canterbury, just close to Waikoku. Yeah, yeah. So, but that just shows the beauty of technology, you know, yeah. we can um, connect even though we're not that far away. Um, so on the podcast, what we do is we talk about people's lives and just trying to hear the stories and people's journeys, because I think we all have stories to tell and we can learn from each other. Um, so the first half, we'll talk a little bit about where you're from and what your background is. And the second half, we're, we're, I think we're going to have a number of rabbit holes to explore because you happen to be looking at a number of different things. And I've seen some of the books that you've edited, some of the papers you've been involved in. So I'm not really sure which direction that will take, but I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to it. So um, to, to begin with, if you could just tell us a little bit about where you're from. Yeah, so David Hall and I, I grew up here where, where I am now on a, on a small farm um, just north of Christchurch in a place called Wood End. We got um, some sheep and some chickens. Um, so it's, it, is a, it is a functioning farm. Um, is that right from, from childhood? Like those are some of your first memories yep, you know, yep. as a up, young, yeah. young child? Yeah, we moved here when I was three years old. My parents um, bought the piece of land and have um, developed it into, yeah, a functional farm, although they were working in different spaces. My dad originally um, ran an appliance shop in Rangiora and then got into vocational education. So he started some um, community colleges around the area that um, provides vocational education for people who, um, who, who, who may have left school early or, or trying to transition their lives into, into sort of meaningful work. Um, and then my mum was a physiotherapist. Um, she passed away uh, 10 years ago, but um, she was a physiotherapist and also established Disabled Skiing Association of New Zealand. So, uh, yeah, that was combining her interests in physio and, and how to help people recover from injuries, but also um, getting them on the slopes and, and um, yeah, giving them a, a, a sense of purpose and new, new objectives. Um, yeah, some of them, some of the people she trained went to para, Winter Paralympics and so on. So. Mm. How old so, were you when she was working on that? Do you have strong memories of it? Or? Oh, very much so. And I was involved um, as well, helping to um, helping as an instructor and a supporter for for people in the ski. So, so yeah, I was very very much engaged and um, yeah, ever ever since I was a little tot, <laughs> helping. <laughs> the races and, and all the rest of it yeah yeah it's interesting that both of your parents were really involved in education it sounds like or you know helping people to learn new skills and do different things given what you have now what you now do as an educator do you, do you draw a direct line there between your parents and their legacy or is it more something that that you wanted to do yourself in, in a way I think I think Potentially, I draw a closer parallel with uh, the sort of the social impact side of what they did. Okay. Um, they were very much engaged with yeah social impact, but you know I've taken a, a pathway which was a bit more um, academic in the in the tertiary education sense. Um, and yeah, so 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 not many of my family have um, have have gone down that particular road of of studying. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm a doctor of political theory, so I, I really did go, did did take that a long way. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But 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 I think in a in a way, even though I have sort of specialised in a in a quite theoretical part of academia, I'm always interested in how to pull that theory into real world impact. And right. and I th and I think there I definitely see the connection with uh 
what my parents did. You know, they're very involved in, in community enterprises and um, and especially with the focus for helping disadvantaged people. And so mm. uh, I think I think that comes through in some of the work that I'm trying to do as well. Interesting. So maybe the heart behind their actions is something that you can trace to. Yeah. I would like to like to hope so. Yeah. I kind of feel similarly about my parents that, you know, I I became a lawyer, like I'm I'm not doing at all what they did. But looking back on their lives, I can see that even back when they were really active in the late nineteen sixties and early nineteen seventies, they were in something called the Peace Corps, which was oh, yeah. by John F. Kennedy. So they had this young, you know, young people's intensity of going out and helping others. And I think I probably did absorb a lot more of that than I had ever realized until quite recently. Yeah. Yep. So, so growing up there, um, maybe just describe the farm for people who are listening. Like, um, what was that like? You know, um, many people listening will, will be in cities and, you know, not have had that experience. Was it lots of daily chores and things for you or? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, obviously, my parents were both focused on on other jobs, so it's not a a farm that required full time um, work. It's more of a lifestyle block. But my sure. dad, a rural up background as well, so he wanted um, he wanted a connection with that. My mum did too, actually, partly. So, um, so, so yeah, they were both keen on having that connection to the land and um, mm-hmm. and that connection to agriculture and food systems. Um, And so often because they were preoccupied with work, that certainly did mean (laughs) plenty of jobs that that fell to me and my two sisters as we grew up. So we did do a lot around the farm and, um, you know, have that, have that engagement with, uh, with agriculture and land use. Um, and yeah, certainly helped out on on other farms around the area, which were more, um, which were you know bigger kind of more full time farms as well. Some of my friends, so so it certainly had that kind of rural background in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I guess it's just, and 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 I guess that that ties into um, my interests in. In environmental policy and, and land use policy and so on, um, I did all succeeded quite well when I went to secondary school and um, in geography, and so took that on at university as as my initial um, degree it was a degree in geography because I I really enjoyed that um, as a discipline. It's interested in how people interconnect with space um, and place, mm-hmm. so that was very kind of natural to me those interests and um so it was kind of a natural connection with your your upbringing or where you grew up yeah absolutely I mean I grew up very much yeah out here on the farm but also shuttling back and forth to Queenstown and Wanaka to help with um, mum's disabled scheme um work and so mm-hmm. you know I feel like while I grew up specifically just in Waikuku I feel like my, you know, where my heart lies is is that stretch between here and um, and the Southern Lakes, really, because I, you know, spent so much of my life kind of shuttling between the two, you know, driving down through mid Canterbury and then up into the hills. Over it's a beautiful drive, isn't it? <laughs> and pass and um, through the Mackenzie country and so on. So. Yeah. And and I think you know, watching out the window, you know, it always gave me that interest in how the how the landscape was formed, you know, the geology of it, but also uh, the impacts from people and land use over uh, past centuries. And um, so, so that, I think, set me up for an interest in geography and um, that eventually pivoted towards politics. <laughs> right. So guide us through that. But just before you do that, where were you studying? Were you here at Canterbury or did you go to another university? Or So I, I did my first year at Canterbury, but then I switched to Otago. So I finished my, um, yeah, my bachelor's in geography there. Yep. Uh, and then I switched to master's in, in Wellington. And that's when I made the transition to political science. And okay. That was very much a kind of purposeful decision because while I'd started off on the physical side of geography, 
you know, measuring erosion and so on and, mm. and kind of understanding the physical aspect of um, land use change. I, you know, grew a concern around the impacts of things like erosion and water quality uh, deterioration and so on, but, you know, decided that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life measuring the decline of um, our environmental resources, but instead yeah. wanted to be involved in, in changing the policies and changing the um, land use patterns that were contributing to environmental degradation. And so that's why I switched into political science for my master's um, mm. at Wellington. And is that is that kind of a moment that you remember or a conversation or was it a sort of gradual buildup that you wanted to shift focus? Because I can understand that, like understand or studying the outcomes or the the detail of why is it like this is quite different to studying how did it get to be like this? What's the foundation that led to whatever it is that is the outcome? Um, I think it was very much just as I described that sense of, yeah, the outcomes and the processes and wanting to understand the processes because, you know, I think on the whole, people are quite concerned about environmental degradation and mm. people don't like seeing the rivers um, lose their water quality and, and, you know, it isn't hard to explain to people, you know, why things like erosion kind of gnaw away at our economic output and, and cause all sorts of problems for, um, for, you know, productivity of the land and so on. Um, it isn't hard to tell that story. So then the question is, well, why don't we do something about it? And mm. that's ultimately a question of politics. Mm. Yeah. It's just interesting to me to think through that transition because, um, you know, like my father-in-law did his PhD in geography and he, he, I think the phrase was geomorphology of coastlines. And so what he was studying was, he's from the UK, he was studying kind of the coast and erosion and yeah. what's, what's happening, why it's happening. But that is obviously quite different to the policies or the, you know, the government thinking or the, what, you know, what leads to some of these environmental results, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you end up in Wellington and then eventually you ended up in the UK as well, right? How did that yeah. happen or what, what happened there? So after the, yeah, after masters, I applied for um, a doctorate at the university of Oxford and um, yeah, that was just cause I decided if I was going to launch into a doctorate, I'd, I'd prefer to do it somewhere exotic and, and, and different um, yep. i actually only did the i applied for the year in lse and to my surprise got um got into oxford um and i actually didn't get into lse so that was my only option and um and yeah i, I actually got that letter the the day after and it, it was it was a couple of days after my my mum got diagnosed with terminal cancer so um, it was a kind of strange time in a, a sort of a, a very bad news story um, combined with a somewhat good news story. But um, yeah. But, so but, she got uh, to participate in knowing that you had this opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I, did, I left um, some weeks after um, she passed away. But um, yeah. But yes, and so she was very supportive. Um, and and help with um help with that as well so mm. um financially because it was it was difficult how how it's gonna kind of make it work especially um coming from new zealand to oxford huh <laughs> yeah 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 i mean there, there are some scholarships available and so on but um yeah that was that was a sort of contribution that she made before she um left yeah. Well, I guess at the time, the exchange rate meant that the New Zealand dollar was worth less than the pound as well, right? So it yeah, was probably, yeah, yeah. it was an uh, expensive time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it wasn't too bad, actually, because the um, global financial crisis had happened and um, oh, okay. that had actually sunk things quite significantly by comparison to New Zealand. So it actually wasn't so bad on that front at all. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I don't know how to answer, ask this question the right way, but to what extent did you feel like um, your mother having supported you and then helped you financially to get there? To what extent has that infused you with energy to do the study that you did and the work that you do today? Because it sounds like she was quite a pivotal figure in your life. And I'm, obviously she's, she's not here now, but in some way, what you're doing now continues the impact that she would probably love to know is going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's right. I mean, parents are always pivotal figures, and um, yeah, I think I think it was just that uh, it certainly gave me a lot of motivation to 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 make it work and to and to get the get the doctorate finished because um, it yeah it was potentially an opportunity that I wouldn't have been able to take up without without her support. So. Um, mm. And yeah, that instilled. Uh, well, I mean, it 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 reinforced my motivation to um to make sure that what I was doing was was of some value elsewhere, and that I wasn't going to get too uh, too whisked off into the you know the abstract side of academia, um, where you know your sort of outputs are just in these obscure journal articles and. Um, and and don't have much relationship to the to real world impact and so it was so, so it was yeah it, it reinforced that that desire to um to make sure that what i was doing and had impact and to and to use that um you know a lot of that good fortune and her support to to try and um use that as a platform for trying to do some some good in the world mm. uh, and mostly that's been in the space of um of climate change policy and that was a focus of my thesis um and you know obviously to as as a very large looming problem um to focus on that to you know ensure the well-being of future new zealanders and future people elsewhere in the world um but also to think about the transition to a low emissions economy as an opportunity to address some of the present issues that we have as well around issues like equality and and social injustice and um and the more immediate impacts of environmental degradation as well so try and and think about climate change in that sense not just as a as a benefit for the future but also to keep that mind on on present peoples and and how to use that as an opportunity to fix current problems as well as long, long-term issues. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Now I like, I like your focus that, cause I think it would be easy having gone to Oxford. It's, it's obviously a great reputation and name to then get pulled into the um, focus on, well, I got a little article in this obscure journal that was read by 17 people, you know, as opposed to the more, um, I guess, more visible role that you've chosen, which is contributing, editing books and being involved in papers and, and coming on podcasts, you know, um, it's, it's quite a different focus from a traditional academic, I think. Um, yeah, well, you, you have to do a bit of that as well. I mean, that's, um, yeah, especially the PBRF system that, that sort of ranks uh, your outputs as an academic, it very much forces you into the into those academic outputs and i think it's also important as well because you know those rigorous articles are a way of um of making sure your thinking is coherent and mm. and and sort of testing your ideas and a real through a really rigorous process of peer review and making sure that you're not just um floating uh floating sort of you know wafty ideas that <laughs> don't have much academic rigor or, or much good connection to empirical evidence and um yeah you know i think especially today as a lot of knowledge and a lot of exchange and a lot of transfer ideas switches to online forums you know it's really important for academics to to um you know reinforce what makes them different from from people who are just you know airing ideas or floating ideas and um yeah online um you know, to to operate in that academic realm, um, you know that you, you know there's a there's a huge gift in that because people people do trust um, 
academics. <laughs> that's, that's one thing that the academic discipline still does have is quite a high level of um, trust from the public. Yeah. And it's a real, it's a real gift and a real asset that needs to be maintained in, in the current era where there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation circling around. Yeah. And so, you know, we really have to um, preserve that, but it's, it's keeping that balance, like not getting, not getting completely um, isolated in that academic bubble and that, that world of journal articles that's trying to keep a bit of a foot in both worlds. Yeah, that makes sense. And about, yeah, having that credibility, isn't it? That, that yeah. you do this, but you do this. And, it, and in a way, it kind of echoes back and forth because I'm sure by writing the academic things, it helps form your thinking about how can I express this to a more mainstream audience and then vice versa. Once I've expressed it here, what is this? What are people actually talking about? And maybe I should research that more. So it's all a healthy circle of um, construction, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And I think like working, you know, working on policy and social impact and things gives you really great ideas around topics that you might explore through theory and so on, because you just are constantly faced with all of these dilemmas, ethical dilemmas or yeah or sort of political problems which you know haven't really been explored in the in the theoretical literature but are just asking to <laughs> to be written up as um as interesting essays or articles so yeah yeah well i, I let's come back to this because i just want to finish off the the sort of the history can i just ask what it was was oxford what you expected it would be like it it has an amazing reputation. I've, I've been there. My, my brother-in-law lives in Oxford, actually, um, and he got his PhD at Oxford, so I kind of know a little bit about it. And when I visited, it was just this amazing, just looking around and seeing the history and just walking through doors that you knew these amazing people had walked through a 100 years before and had gone on to do these amazing things. It's that sense of history, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that aspect of it is, is um, fantastic and it really sharpens your mind in a way because you feel that, um, and it, it, it has its negative side too. It's this sort of pressure to, to do well and to, and to really um, try, and, try and operate at that higher level and, and that yeah. comes, with a, comes with a lot of anxieties and, and, and pressure that, that is quite difficult. It's... Um, and yeah, but it, it, it has a way of, of getting the best out of you if you, if you can manage it because you really- You can accept the pressure and-, and Yeah, yeah, you do. You you it. <laughs> but life can be quite um, cloistered and, and narrow, narrow-minded there. So, um, but, but yeah, like, I mean, it, it is exactly, it's those, and the, the, I, I think the thing that I miss the most is, is just the access to resources and, and the access to networks there. I just, um, you know, you're constantly having the opportunity to go to seminars and lectures by, you know, the the people whose books you've been reading the week before. And right. you know, then you go and have a pint of beer with them uh, afterwards and um and just and just talk through some of the issues in a in a kind of casual way. It's it's that that was really a great opportunity, um, especially because I was you know, going into some of the more theoretical, philosophical aspects. Um, right. My work, you know, is really, up until then, it had been much more around political science and social science. So um, I got a really great accelerated education in that, in that part of um, academia. Right. Um, yeah, it's an amazing place because I'm just thinking back uh, when I visited, we went to, I think the pub is called The Eagle and Child. And yep. that's the pub where, oh, Tolkien sat over there and C.S. Lewis sat with him and they, they had their Inklings group. And you can just imagine the minds, the conversations that they, they would have had with the other people. And it just has that sort of vibe of rich history. You know, it, that, that's yeah, what yeah, struck yeah. me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, what, what exactly were you studying? Did you have a, a specific topic for a thesis or what, um, can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so like I was saying earlier, I, I got, 
interested in this puzzle as to why we don't do the things that we know that we should be doing, mm -hmm. especially around issues like climate change, um, where you know often often people say it's a it's a it's a problem that people don't know enough about or they don't care enough about. But actually, polling shows that most people do care about climate change and they know at least enough to know what they shouldn't be doing. So the question is, why aren't they doing that? And um, I got interested in how recent work in, in social psychology especially might help to make sense of that. Um, especially the kinds of work coming out of behavioral economics like Daniel Kahneman and uh, someone who's a bit more in the politics space is Jonathan Haidt. Um, and their work around the way that we make decisions um, which give a lot of priority to our intuitions and our hunches and our gut feelings, but not necessarily, we, you know, we don't necessarily take the time to bring in our um, reasoned, rational thinking, which might, uh, you know, start to bring in questions around issues like climate change, which kind of sit in the back of our brains as these... Um, in the back of our minds is these is these uh you know looming complex abstract issues mm. so 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 that was essentially where i started off and the, the thesis as theses often do um took its own course um and it ended up being much more around methodological questions of why uh, political theory and political philosophy hadn't done much work around integrating these empirical findings and psychology and the theory of how people think um, into the work that they were doing uh, oh. in, in sort of developing theories of politics and developing um, policy theories. Okay. So, so I'd love to understand that a, a, a little bit in more detail, and I'm sure you can give yeah. me that. But just before we do that, what's a, just a real world practical example of what you're talking about in terms of social psychology and how we make decisions? Like, is it I'm going to buy a car and I have a budget and I go and I, I'm in the yard and I'm looking around and I, I just like the look of that car. That's my intuition, the color, the shape or whatever. And then the, the rational side is, well, what are the emissions that that car would, you know, which is more efficient? Is it electric? Is it not electric? Is that the type of thing you're talking about? Like, I just want to make it really real, you know, for it me, is. practically, what is it that you're, you're meaning? Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, uh, that's a, that is a major question. I, I mean, just to use your example, yeah, there, there is things like... Um, Oh, how to how to explain this? But but yeah yeah I mean I mean like so so one of the problems for um, cars is that is that the EV cars have a high upfront cost which is higher than the um, than the cost of of internal combustion engine cars or ICE vehicles as we say, mm -hmm. um, and so people get put off by the cost of um, of that because it seems more expensive but actually all of the the life cycle analysis now of of these vehicles um, especially in a place like New Zealand which has um, you know good access to clean electricity at a reasonable price mm -hmm. um, the life cycle analysis of it it, it it actually stacks up that the it's much more likely that it, it will pay off over the long time and especially year after year as the cost of batteries and and um, so on goes down then that economic case stacks up but but people see the upfront cost and that's the one that they're most prone to to take into consideration and and less prone to take into consideration those um those longer term costs um not just the cost of running the car but also the cost of the emissions from running a fossil fuel powered car and and the contribution of that to these large collective problems like climate change and um you know the this is a lot of the social psychology verifies this that you know we we tend to take uh, short-term costs you know they weigh on our mind and they weigh on our decision making 
much more than is um, econo economically rational or even economically optimal uh, than, the, than the longer term costs. We tend to discount those. Um, but it, yeah. It, it's, That's it's the psychological good. aspects of it, is it? That, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, I mean, our decision making isn't necessarily rational. No, exactly. It's and, not. And, and we kind of, and I, I'm guilty of this too. Like if I was looking at, okay, should I get a leaf? Or should I get another car? And the leaf is, I don't know, 20,000 and the other car is 12,000. Like my rational mind is going, well, it's cheaper to get that one, even though the long-term impacts on the environment and probably the long-term operating costs would even out or be better to go for the leaf. It's that sort of psychology you're talking about, isn't it? And then, and then when you start thinking through you know, the economics of, of runaway climate change. I mean, at the moment, things are on track for 3.5 degrees of warming and the sorts of economic impacts of that just are just incomprehensible. I mean, <laughs> to, to, a, to a large extent, the, the kind of, um, you know, the priceless costs in, in the sense that, you know, you, it just, the cost gets so large that you can't really fathom the the impact i mean the yeah the 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 what the, the extent to which it weighs down on gdp i mean you, you can't even sort of factor in all of the implications and flow on effects and the and the, it it just it just is and particularly like if sea levels rise exactly or, you know exactly. then all of a sudden all of this property that was productive is underwater <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's huge isn't it <laughs> yeah 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 um yeah, and, and so we know that the economic impacts are very large with, with high levels of uncertainty. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, because they're distant and because of those uncertainties, it, it, you, you know, we don't make economically rational decisions um, about them and, and factor these into our present day decisions. And, um, you know, so some of the psychology can be quite helpful to... Um, to think about to understand why we struggle to make those decisions um mm. but you know i especially as the, the the more i kept this this was one of the great realizations that i came to in my thesis was that um the that the psychology only helps you so far um and actually often it, it's just kind of empirically demonstrating points that old um philosophers or economists <laughs> have been talking about for centuries right. um, you know there's a long train of of thinkers like from from david hume back in the early stages of the scottish enlightenment up to friedrich nietzsche <laughs> and, yep. and so on you know who were, who were actually quite astute about the fact that um, we didn't make very sensible decisions uh, around a lot of things which were obvious and that's kind of you know one of the strains of thought which is um which which is part of enlightenment thinking but is often forgotten about by people like Steven Pinker and so on and um, yeah and that's like, fascinating and I guess the, like, the... I was just going to say someone yeah. like the the economist Pigou has a really nice phrase for what we were talking about just before that you know humans have faulty mental telescopes that's sort of what he was talking about and why people discount um future value in that sense but he was you know he came to that realization a long time before social psychologists like Kahneman came along and, and demonstrated that empirically yeah so just drawing the threads together the the detail of the social social psychology or why do i buy the cheaper car instead of the more expensive one what you were then looking at was why policy itself hadn't been more influenced by this sort of research is that was that yeah, it yeah, yeah so that was a, something that i started out with especially because i was looking at the way that this was being brought into economics through the behavioral economics literature and i was interested as to what that um transition might look like in political philosophy right and then ultimately came to the realization that you know political philosophy had in its ways been grappling with this issue for a very long time um and you know some of the psychology can be quite helpful to sharpen up some of those intuitions that philosophers have had for a long time um but i also came to the realization that you know 
a lot of the political theorists had also had quite astute insights into how some of the psychology um, was problematic in its own way because it had certain political presuppositions and so on, which, um, which you know, re reduced its usefulness or, or, mm. or created, created a new set of problems. And I think, um, mm. you know, we're becoming increasingly aware of that around uh, behavioral economics and especially nudge theory which is one of the um, outputs of, of how behavioral economics and has been, has been um, taken up by public policy thinking where, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but you know, the idea that you know, we can use these psychological insights to uh, nudge people to do, to do certain things and to make certain behavioral changes um, by the way that we present them with decisions. So, I don't know, an, an example is, um, say, opt-in and opt-out kind of decisions around, uh, you, know, you know, for our driver's licenses, for instance, in New Zealand, you know, we can opt in to having our organs used if we, um, you know, are in a car crash or we can opt out. And, uh, and people have a certain bias towards just going along with, with, with whatever is 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 in place so so if if it's a if it's a um if it's a purposeful opt-in that choice that they have to make they're less likely to to okay. do it and if it's a, if they're if they're required to opt out then you know it's that it's that extra bit of effort which becomes a behavioral hurdle to them actually doing and and that and that choice can be can be quite um separate from their actual strongly held beliefs on these issues right so if you phrase it, um, tick here, if you do not want to donate, then exactly. that's going to get one result as opposed to tick here, if you do want to donate. And it's the subtle difference in the phrasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So these sorts of setups are called the, the kind of the choice architecture right. of certain decisions that we make in, in policy and the way that we engage with various kind of ethical or political issues. And um, yeah. So, so nudge theorists, uh, you know, they, they look at how these choices are made and how they can redesign the choice architecture in which um, these decisions are made. So that's a real life example of how, um, of how you know, this psychology is, is, is integrated into, into modern day policy making. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's been taken up. The UK has a behavioral insights unit and government, which has been making decisions um, in, involved in policy design. And I noticed actually that Ministry for Environment has recently released a paper on behavioral insights into the choice of electric vehicles versus, um, versus um, internal combustion vehicles. So, so that, you know, they've got a bunch of insights around that, that, can address the, the 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 example that you raised earlier, right? Um, but but then you know the flip side of this is that you know a lot of the political theorists have, have got quite critical of of behavioural insights and and the sorts of recommendations it makes. I mean, it, I think the I think the conclusion I've come to is that it's it's quite, it is it is useful in it, in its place, but the the term nudge is quite helpful in the sense that it's really only talking about minor behaviour change, um, and it isn't neutral because there's always some policy maker who's deciding what's good for you. Um, it's it's undemocratic in that sense that it's a it is someone making a decision on the choice of, on the on the behalf of other people, um, and unless there's some process involved which is, um, you know, gives that choice legitimacy, then it's quite technocratic in that sense that it's, it's nudging people in decisions that they don't necessarily, haven't necessarily consented to or given their, their sort of thought through and um, endorsement for. Well, that's uh, the interesting thing, isn't it? Because we, I use this picture a lot on the podcast, but sometimes we're like fish swimming in the fish in the bowl and we don't even know that there's water there because this is what we know. Um, like you, I've lived overseas. And so it's quite interesting if you go to a different culture or context. And one of the things I actually love to do is just, if I'm in a new country, go to the supermarket 
and just walk through the supermarket and just see the different products where they arrange things, you know, what it, what it is you can buy. And it's quite interesting, I think, thinking about culture and different ways of approaching, you know, I lived in Japan for five years. And so they have very, very different ways of arranging things and, and, and being, I guess. Um, and yeah, you do wonder how much of it comes back to the the big brother fears of the government is kind of controlling things without us even knowing it, yeah. um, which I guess would be part of the analysis that you would do, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the the nudge theory is is sits within a framework called libertarian paternalism. So okay, they kind of they kind of admit that it is a paternalistic form of politics that they're making decisions on the behalf of other people. But the argument is that because they're just influencing your choices rather than imposing regulation, that it's not inconsistent with libertarian ideas of the freedom of the individual. So, mm -hmm. so nudge theory comes out of this, um, this attempt to try and um, square that circle <laughs> and, 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 and uh, yeah, and to, to influence influence public policy outcomes in a way that's consistent with um, a libertarian worldview of of the role of the state and the and the state not yeah not restricting I, choice but but yeah setting it up so that the free choices of individuals um, uh, can nevertheless conform with with positive public policy outcomes, but obviously. As you can imagine, there's a rich debate uh, among libertarians yeah. and, and policy um, policy analysts as to whether whether that whether the circle really is squared on that front. Yeah, yeah, because you can easily take it to the next scenario and say, what if what if it isn't a benevolent person who's helping to make these nudge decisions, and actually there's some freedoms being taken away in the way that things are phrased and um, particularly when it comes to privacy and uh, you know, I think we've, we've abdicated so much of our privacy by the little tick boxes with all the apps we download and all, you know, I've got my phone here. <laughs> There's a lot of information that's going out into the ether that we've just ticked and, assume yeah, yeah, yeah. that it's okay <laughs> and as a lawyer i guess i see behind the scenes that there are terms and conditions often but we're not reading page seven paragraph c sub yeah. point three you know <laughs> so yeah, yeah, um, yeah. it's interesting this is, this is a, a domain that a lot of this um social psychology literature is also being taken up very enthusiastically is is the design of um online platforms uh digital online platforms so a lot of these insights and a lot of this idea of choice architectures um, is used to design and shape people's interactions with um, mm. digital, the digital world. And, and again, it's often quite manipulative and um, it's not necessarily, especially in that domain, it's not necessarily like, you know, the nudge theory at least is trying to use these kind of manipulative psychological tools to steer people into positive public policy outcomes, you know, improving, it's often used for, for health outcomes and so on to, you, you know, rearrange people's choice, choice architectures to steer them away from um, unhealthy foods, for instance, and, and onto healthier options. Yeah. Um, but, but in the digital world, it is not necessarily used at all. Or at all in that way, it's it's used in a way to make you spend more time online, to 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 spend more of your money online. Um, you know all of the the ways of using advertising and and trying to attract your attention. You know all of this is a way to try and make you spend money online. And so the yeah, it it certainly can and is used in ways that are more unscrupulous and yeah. uh, self interested. And I guess, you know, thinking about social media, the little red little tick or, or oh, you've got a notification, I better just check it. You know, you probably don't need to check it, but there's something there that you want to check, have a look at. And, and I guess where, in my mind, what I think about as well is, you know, Germany in the 1930s, late 1930s, 
there were really good people who were were hoodwinked <laughs> essentially you know they it, it was such a gradual progression that that things were happening and then all of a sudden i guess for for many of them they woke up one day and realized that the state had completely taken over and and it wasn't at all what they thought it would be and and some of them had probably endorsed where they had gotten to uh, without thinking through. So I guess the, my point is today, you know, there's still that danger, isn't there, of, of people, authoritarian people using this tools that we now understand even better in terms of choice and psychology. Um, and that's always a, to be watching out for. Yeah, and I, I mean, this is something that I, came to realize when I did my thesis as well, just that um, the, 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 this, this kind of nudge theory approach, you know, it, it is very um, narrow and, and the kinds of behavior changes it can create, they just, they just pale in comparison to the sorts of things you're describing. I mean, the, you know, large social movements and, and the kinds of politics of, um, you know, of, of mass belief, uh, you know, the politics of the state, um, the politics of, of regulation. I mean, the, these sorts of politics can create huge change for, for, the, for the better and for the absolute worst. Um, yeah. For example, you were talking about uh, the rise of Nazi Germany. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, there, there's a, there's a, authoritarian politics in play and a, and a politics of, of mass ideology and, and um, a sort of group psychology there, um, which, which is very much different and operates in, a, in, a, in another sphere again um, in creating these ideas that people can't see beyond. Uh, and so, yeah, I was very lucky actually to um, have as a, a bit of a mentor there, Professor Michael Frieden in Oxford, who's who's really one of the world's best on um, on the the philosophy and politics of ideology. So mm -hmm. I learned uh, I learned an awful lot from him, and uh, yeah, they, I did learn exa exactly this these the ways that these um, these collective ideas and and sort of systems of ideas. Um, you know, we have all these words, liberalism, socialism, communism. Um, <laughs> Lots of isms. You know, yeah, green, green ideologies and, um, and, and these sort of populist authoritarian ideologies, you know, they, they really have an enormous powerful effect on, um, on behavior. And that's the kinds of, um, of behavior change which really you know, these are the pivotal moments of, of history is when these kinds of ideas take a hold amongst majorities of people and, and steer um, a society in a different direction. And that's just something that, you know, the behavioral economics and the nudge approach, it just doesn't even compare to that level of behavior change. And um, to, to turn it back to climate change policy, you know, I mean, I guess that's the Ultimately, it's it's that kind of change uh, which we need. I, I think the behavioral economics stuff certainly has a place in, um, in in nudging us to do the right thing. Uh, but ultimately, it, it's not going to deliver the kinds of outcomes we need. We need that um, we yeah. we need that collective belief in something, and we need to make sure that it's a collective belief in a better world and improved well-being and and um, not you know what we're at risk of seeing in the last couple of years is, is collective beliefs which um which are a little more reminiscent of of the nazi germany example although mm. i hesitate to make that comparison because they're always you know they're always of their own time and, and unique and different in their, in their in their ways but you know there's obvious obvious um reasons to be fearful and weary of, of what's going on at the moment uh, with some of these um yeah forms of of negative you know kind of violent populism uh, are on the rise in various yeah. places 
Yeah, well, the, the interesting thing, what you're talking about, I think the reality is when we're talking about the environment and the future and climate change is that nobody's going to say we shouldn't look after our planet. Like, that's pretty easy to, to agree to. But then saying, okay, Stephen, are you going to buy a Leaf car because it's going to cost a bit more? Or Stephen, how are you at your packaging? You know, are you recycling? Are you all these the actual flow on. And the interesting thing I think is that in some ways what we need is a circuit breaker, you know, just something that really jolts the whole system. And we're recording this during this lockdown for COVID-19. Um, so it's early May 2020. And I wonder if this is showing us that it is possible for mass, mass uh, patterns of behavior to change really quickly if there's a good enough reason and getting, you know, the uh, COVID-19 seems to be motivation for people to alter their lifestyles in a way that even six weeks ago before the lockdown began, I think if we'd had this podcast, we would never have guessed that like the whole world would be infected and countries would shut down. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you want to riff off of that? Any thoughts about about yeah, I mean, I've obviously been thinking about this a lot, um, as everybody has been. Uh, I mean, I, it, it may or may not be. And I think, um, you know, one example is the global financial crisis, which is the last uh, crisis of this magnitude, which actually um, may well appear to be a smaller one, <laughs> a smaller one than, um, than this. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the global... After that, there was also a sense that maybe we would change and learn some lessons. And in some ways, we we didn't at all. You know, a lot of a lot a lot of um, things continued as they were, and and you know, some of the opportunity to to better regulate some of the risks wasn't taken up. Um, then again, you know, some some of those risks were taken up because a lot of the financial sector realised it was in their self interest not to allow that those kinds of um, vulnerabilities to build up in the way that they had prior to the GFC um, through, you know, a lot of these complex um, financial arrangements and complex instruments that were being developed that, that were, that were um, baking in a lot of risk into the system. Um, and I, and I think, you know, I think, I think we're presented with a similar, a similar moment now that, you know, there is, there is opportunities to do things better, but there is also a lot of forces that um, bring us back to the business as usual. Um, yeah. you, know, you know, some of them are intentful in that sense that there's, there's vested interests who, who were doing rather well with the way that things were. And so, you know, they will already be lobbying uh, with their various governments to make sure that economic stimulation and stabilization investments are favoring um, them and, and, you know, making sure that the recovery resurrects old ways of doing things. Um, but, but then some of the forces which, you know, push us back to business, usual, business as usual are, are quite understandable that, you know, people just you know, people have livelihoods that they're trying to protect and, and they know, they know what they know. And, um, yeah. And like you say, it's business as usual and yeah, yeah, yeah. you and, had a job and you did this. And so, yeah, yeah. Keep getting back. Yeah. yeah. I mentioned the, the yeah. build back better. current disruption with, uh, you know, adopting new practices and so on is just, you know, one, one too many changes on top of one another. And so, yeah. There's a, there's a risk aversion there, but but a lot of it will be out of our hands. I mean, mm. you know, tourism, you could try and um, <laughs> resurrect that as much as you want, but at least in the short to midterm, you know, there's just no no easy options for that. And also, the oil sector, um, especially in the states, is just looking at enormous volatility out of coming out of this uh the 
you know, there were a lot of vulnerabilities baked into the oil and gas sector coming up towards COVID, um, especially the shale sector was highly indebted and so incredibly exposed to a disruption like this. And because a lot of investors are um, seeing the way that things are going with the low, low emissions transition and seeing that as, as more or less inevitable, um, especially over the next decade, the not, you know, the increasingly oil and gas companies, especially those exposed to shale, are looking like really bad investments. And so investors are just trying to reduce their exposure to these companies. And, you know, there's just, it looks that the, the, the disruption there will just have um, irreversible effects uh, to, to that sector. And so, and, and that is going to, mean a lot of volatility of, of supply and a lot of volatility of price in the coming decade and um, and that's only going to add to the sense that we really need to move beyond our reliance on that because you know our dependencies on on that as a source of energy are just going to become more and more risky and more and more costly um, and so and so these are the sorts of ways that this can play out in the COVID um, shock may well be a critical juncture from which things uh, change. And, you know, so far I've only really talked about the sorts of things which are kind of out of our choice, you know. I mean, there's a whole other question there as to to what extent we can all band together and, and choose to make this a, um, a, new, a an opportunity for a new direction. And, and that is certainly possible as well. Yeah, I'd like to think that that's where we end up. But unfortunately, often we have this short term thinking. And it, like we've talked about through this, uh, our psychology is kind of looking after ourselves in the immediate right now. Um, I, I guess that that's one positive thing. I think New Zealand does have the chance as a smaller nation to actually lead the way in many different ways. Um, one of the areas I've done a lot in is um, impact enterprises, sometimes called social enterprises. And I think that's an area, the idea of combining profit and purpose, you know, with, with companies that are fulfilling more than just how much profits get returned to the shareholders, but looking at their broader mission. Like, I think that's an example of something where New Zealand could really do it well and could have enabling, um, you know, the government could actually come to the party and help to enable it to be done well. And then it could be an example to other parts of the world. But sometimes I feel like I'm too naive and uh, <laughs> dreaming of the future uh, utopia, you know. But, but I think there is real possibility in areas like that. Um, can I just mention one thing? I know Rebecca Mills is a mutual friend with her. Um, she was involved and you were involved with Build Back Better paper, which just came out a few days ago. Um, do you just want to mention what that's about and what the hope was for that? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's better to speak to Rebecca about that, really. I mean, I was just uh, one of many people she talked to. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I guess it, it, it was really, it was, it was working towards that, that point that we just um, made about, you know, that there is an opportunity here for a positive vision as well. You know, there's a lot of a lot of the change that may come out of the COVID-19 crisis is, is um, things that are out of our control and us having to manage with the, these, um, these contingencies and these necessities, like these disruptions and these flow on effects and a lot of that will shape our outcome. But there is this, this opportunity here to, to use this as a, a launching pad for something better. And, um, and, and I, and I guess Rebecca and yourself and, and me as well, you know, we've all found this language of, of impact helpful. And, and that's what Rebecca was teasing out in this is that, you know, there is a emerging um, practice around responsible investment, social enterprises. Um, you know, I've worked a lot in climate finance and sustainable finance in, in recent years as well. Um, as you can probably tell, I have a kind of wandering, wandering interests, which is, um, which is a, a classic um, attribute of, of geography. Um, 
but it, but I keep on I keep on sort of going into these spaces which seem to hold some part of the solution for me and mm. and so in recent years yeah this is the space that I've been working a lot in is is the finance space and how do you um, mobilize investment into creating some of uh, the sorts of outcomes which are better aligned with um yeah with with people and planet um. Mm. And yeah, I, th I think there is a real opportunity for New Zealand's Aotearoa to, to use some of these frameworks and other frameworks um, to guide our decision making over the next couple of years as we come out of this disruption. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, another key piece of that is the living standards framework and the well-being approach. Um, and that has a lot of... Um, a lot of overlap with the impact space where it's all about trying to measure and identify all of the impacts that a particular project or activity has, not just the financial returns, but also the social returns and the yeah. environmental returns. And also the negative um, social and environmental and, and financial impacts. Um, and just trying to get a more integrated picture of um, of these interventions and then to make you know decisions accordingly and that's another way of of kind of bringing in those um those costs and benefits that uh our psychology sometimes tends to um tends to distort or or um downplay or diminish in, mm -hmm. in our in our decision making it's just so much easier for us to to make our decisions based on the on the things that we can measure and you know the tragedy is that often what we can measure is exactly the financial costs and benefits but not those wider costs and benefits and um you know increasingly we get better at at um at measuring and assessing those through all sorts of frameworks whether you know it's the impact project management stuff and in the in the impact sector or um net, what natural capital protocol is doing overseas and trying to um help us to understand the um the economics of a, of our natural resources or you know whether it's the united nations sustainable development goals or the living standards framework these big kind of policy frameworks um which also kind of capture all of these elements and and illuminate the way that all of these challenges are interconnected mm -hmm. um so yeah there, i mean there is a there is an opportunity to do that and um and it's up to all of us um our political decision makers um but also us to just insist upon using this as an opportunity to do that and um and i mean i think there's also something which just keeps coming into my mind at the moment is is the lessons of the recovery from the christchurch earthquake as well and just um i wasn't you know i was based in the U uk during that but you know was visiting family during that and um during that time and yeah i just feel that not enough new zealanders took notice of what was happening in christchurch around that time and i feel like that neglect is now a real um a real potential um it's sort of a lost opportunity really because you know if if the rest of new zealand especially you know many of the policy makers and decision makers in wellington were were to have followed more closely um, the sort of, <laughs> you know, the, the recovery process and the regeneration process and things, I think they'd be better prepared for the sorts of decisions that need to be made now and, and some of the risks and some of the uh, mistakes that might be made. And um, I, certainly, I certainly do have worries that, you know, the government may well jump too quickly into into things and projects and infrastructure projects, which it thinks are helpful for communities, um, which actually the community doesn't have so much buy-in for or um, 
which doesn't fit their community's own vision for what they think, uh, you, you know, where they think the future lies. I think there's a real risk of, of, of repeating those mistakes right now. So, yeah, no, I hear you. There's a lot in what you've just said. And I think the the fact that the phrase some people are using is shovel ready shows that it's like, well, it's ready to go, but wait a minute, is it ready to go? You know, like you got to ask that question, don't you? And, and actually yeah, talk. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think the, the phrase we really need is probably future ready projects. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's projects which are future ready in the sense that they're conscious of, of these large trends like climate change and biodiversity loss, and they're not contributing to, to these, or they're not exposing our, you know, exposing our communities to these risks by, you know, putting infrastructure near the sea <laughs> within the, you know, within the bounds of um, sea level rise or, or, or in flood prone um, areas or so on, you know, there's that sort of future readiness. But I think it's also the future readiness of like, you know, how has the world changed after COVID and what kinds of jobs do people really need? And, and what kinds of, um, you know, are we trying to resurrect the, the status quo from before? Or are we trying to go into a, a, a state of regeneration where we're, you know, working with some of the assets which are around us and trying to find ways of um, creating new value out of, uh, out of these things. You know, some of, the, some of that was the, the best examples of, um, of, you know, the Christchurch regeneration was, was, you know, the gap filler projects and so on, these ways of, you know, creating new opportunities and new experiences out of um out of out of the the rubble <laughs> and 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 out of what was what was there um and you know some of the community driven projects like you know the playground and the library and stuff are the real shining examples of of how to do things that brings everybody along and reimagines the future and um and creates that reality but then I mean, some of the worst examples, and I could see this problem. Uh, it's it's painful to watch, you know. But that, you know, some of the mismatches between the jobs that people needed, um, you know, after the earthquake, a lot of the job losses were in the tourism sector and the hospitality sector, just like in the COVID disruption. And yet, so many of the new jobs that were created were the construction sector, and there was just a mismatch between the skills that people had. And so the, the construction sector in, in Christchurch struggled to meet, meet their job vacancies. You know, they struggled to, to find labor supply to meet their demand. Um, and that was even with access to international labor markets, which, which we don't have now because of the um, border restrictions. And so it's so easy to see that mistake being made again, relying on, the construction of, of gray infrastructure to um, to generate jobs, which are which are ill matched for uh, the people who are finding themselves unemployed and maybe ill matched geographically as well, because they might maybe creating jobs where people aren't. And then, and I think you know the the way out of this is just to also think about the other kinds of social uh, the other kinds of infrastructure we need which includes social infrastructure, you know, and that's something, again, that we saw in Canterbury after the earthquakes was, you know, the social infrastructure of, of social connection and trust and, and a sense of um, togetherness and so on, you know, that was the infrastructure that really helped people to get through some really hard times. Um, but that, that requires jobs as well, you know. <laughs> we, need, we need therapists, we need um, people who can, who can create food for people who are going hungry we need um and and some of those sorts of jobs are much better suited to people who have been in hospitality and tourism and so on and you know also in natural infrastructure um you know canterbury christchurch rather is you know the there's a whole new park emerging where buildings used to be um and you know that's going to be delivering positive environmental impacts for for Christchurch and you know reducing some of the flood risk and so on you know that will be a natural infrastructure asset which will be reducing flood risk and so on in, in the future and so 
that in itself is a kind of infrastructure, which again, um, if we were to create genuine well-paid jobs out of enhancing that natural infrastructure, um, then there's, there's jobs, there's potential jobs there as well, rather than relying on volunteer labor all the time. Mm. Yeah, the thing that strikes me just through our whole conversation comes back to that word impact. And, you know, even thinking to your parents and the impact that they wanted to have, those were examples in their own lives. And now what you're doing is looking for where can we have impact. And then with impact, in my mind, I, I'm using the word like holistic view quite a lot these days, like rather than looking narrowly and saying, well, what's the interest rate? What's the term, you know, like actually thinking beyond that to what's the true impact here. And um, I'm involved, I'll tell you offline about it, an initiative called Community Finance. And mm -hmm. that's looking at matching philanthropic funders um, with social housing. So the, the community housing providers know how to build houses, but often can't access capital the philanthropic funders have capital but can't build the houses so can we match them and so we've come up with this initiative and so far raised 15 million dollars for a salvation army social housing um, yeah. from the likes of the Tyndall foundation and Lindsay foundation and others so it's just it, but the the reason that it's working is that the the pitch isn't you're going to get X percentage back, like a bank would be focused on, like the interest rate is this this many basis points, you know, and and you'll get paid back on this date and this date and this date. The pitch is much more about there's going to be 70 new clean green houses, you know, that solar panels, double glazing, they're going to be efficient, and there's going to be families living in them the children are going to have stable childhoods, which means they go to school. The, the parents will, will hopefully have employment, you know, that's longer term. Like it's all these flow on impacts that it's so easy just to say, yeah, but the interest rate is this, you know, and the return on the loan is this rather than thinking holistically about the true impact that's having. And I think what you and Rebecca and others, which I really encourage to see sort of an ecosystem of thinkers developing, and each of us are kind of in different areas, you know, like I think we need that. We need as much as, you, you know, you need the accountants, you need the lawyers, you need the professionals, but you also need people like you, academics. We need others bringing that same approach of saying, well, we need to understand the impact. We need to really measure it in a holistic way. And then we need to feed that in so that the policies can reflect where we're actually having the impact. That's, that's sort of my takeaway anyway from our conversation. Yeah, yeah. And there, and there has to be rigor around it as well because otherwise money can be poorly spent and it won't deliver yep. the impacts that it's supposed to. And that's as bad as not doing it in the first place but, right. and and it will also undermine people's willingness to use um money to try and achieve those outcomes in the future so it's absolutely yep. right and um yeah i mean that the housing that housing thing sounds interesting and it also to add to that holistic approach it also is important in the post-covid era because you know having a warm dry well ventilated house is also good for household immunity and um you know covid being a respiratory um covid19 having a respiratory effect at um you know the more robust somebody's respiratory health is it seems uh the less likely they are to have a critical case of the of the disease that comes from the virus there's already evidence of correlations of people having worse outcomes if they're in places with high air pollution um, so that sets people up for greater vulnerability towards um, towards the negative health impacts. And um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm familiar with the Tyndall Foundation's work in that space partly because I've worked with them as well to design um, trees that count, which is a another yeah, sort of great initiative. initiative. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I did the original conceptual design of that for for them coming out of yeah. some of the work that I did with pure advantage around climate change policy but mm, great yeah, the, the idea underneath that was very much to um to emphasize people's connections to one another and also their connections to the environment especially by 
you know, this process of counting the trees and um, making a pledge to plant a tree and then recording um, it being planted, it sort of sets a person up to have a particular kind of relationship to the tree. It's not just a, an yeah. absolute connection like you get in, in offsetting. It's actionable, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and it just kind of reminds people of the, the action that they can take in the world so so while you know the trees planted through the trees that can't aren't going to solve our, um, our our emissions problems overnight i always you know said to you know one of the justifications for doing it nevertheless was that it just sort of reconnects people into into not just the environment but their own capacity for action and their own capacity for change that if mm -hmm. they if they plant one tree, then they, they realize it's um, something that they can do. And then it, it um, yeah, empowers them to do other things and to make other changes and to, to yeah, to, to think about how they can change the wider environment to protect the trees that they've planted as well. Because I think um, at one point you were talking about you know, that dilemma that we all face in our individual choices um, around, you know, what kind of car to buy or what kind of products to purchase and which to avoid. But at the end of the day, it's that big collective change that we need. And um, yeah, we need to keep, keep our eyes on that. You know, it's, you know, there is individual choices to be made, but the big change is going to come from, um, that big collective will to change and especially how we transmit that and how we project our kind of collective um, force on political institutions, um, our governments to, to, to make those changes because, you know, they have the power to make these, these pivotal changes, which, um, yeah, which, you know, transform institutions and and transform the way that public investment is directed and so on. And so, um, and that's the thing I think that's challenging is for each of us, what's the role that we can play? Because yeah. I know for me as a lawyer, I could easily just get bogged down in the detail of this client needs this document and this document and not make space or carve space out of my day to think about these bigger things and maybe do a podcast with someone like you to hopefully get people thinking. And, but for each of the listeners, you know, what is it that you're involved in? How can you take action? How can you be involved? Um, I'm putting out a book review probably tomorrow um, on this book called New Power. I don't know if you've read it. Um, it's by Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms. And so they contrast new power with old power the new power being sort of collective action, you know, the crowdsourcing. So Black Lives Matter as a movement or the Me Too movement, like it's flat, it's, there's no central figure. It's just sort of millions of people getting involved as opposed to old power, which is hierarchical, structured, you know, there's somebody in charge. And it's quite interesting to think about the time in history, you know, thinking of thinking of time itself and history, and we haven't really gone into political philosophy in detail, but just how things do change as technology changes as well. Um, and, and, and our unique moment in time, I guess, is that yeah, yeah. We, we can actually have an impact and we can be part of these bigger movements. Whereas in the past, we probably would have been sitting, you know, going to our nine to five jobs and kind of going home and, and not necessarily having the activation of, well, I can take action using my phone. It's it's quite interesting time, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's there's work for all of us to do in whatever roles we happen to occupy. And yeah. um, you know, I get to work a lot with through this climate finance work with um, you know various organisations in the finance sector. You know, one of our partners for the Climate Innovation Lab is ANZ. You know, and there's a you know, there's a huge realization within their organization of, of where things are pointing and their need to be part of that change um, rather than, yeah, rather than being stuck in, in the old way of doing things. And so, yeah, there's, there's allies and opportunities everywhere. Um, mm. And ultimately we're, we're going to create the biggest impact in the, in the roles that we know best and the places where, you know, we know best it's, it's best for us to, um, 
to lever that kind of power and our own wisdom and our certain occupations and that just that's a, a a value that anyone can deliver in whatever role or vocation they happen to have yeah exactly well david i have a feeling that we could just keep talking <laughs> so i'm going to draw a line under this interview but thank you so much for your time i just loved hearing your backstory your background Particularly, I love those connections with, you know, what your parents were involved in, because I think that's something, sometimes when you get asked the question, what do you do, you, you know, the answer is, well, I'm a lecturer at AUT, and I'm an academic, and, and it's just going a little bit deeper to understand, well, that's interesting, you know, that the role that your mother and your father played, and, and then also just thinking about the impact side of things and the fact that you're trying purposefully trying to get involved in a number of different initiatives and 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 have an impact yourself um, through those different things, which I find really encouraging because I'm I think we're on the same page. I'm trying to do the same by you know doing a podcast and doing other things. Um, and I think the listeners probably are are aligned. So hopefully we can all encourage each other. And develop a really good ecosystem in in Aotearoa of people who are yeah, yeah. Who are doing yeah. I mean, they were they were my parents were both impact entrepreneurs before before the term um, was even around, and I'm I'm very proud of them, and um yeah, hope to hope to be able to follow follow that um legacy. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. <laughs> yes, Stephen.